Namaste everyone. Um, it's my privilege to welcome uh, Professor Puneet Binlish. Professor Binlish is presently a faculty for Hindu spirituality and society in Faculty of Religion and Theology, Fiji University, Amsterdam, the Netherlands. His research interests lie in spirituality, indigenous research design, leadership, and spiritual care. He is known to bring ancient wisdom from Hindu indigenous sources to enhance the understanding of issues for contemporary relevance. Dr. Binlish will speak on the topic, Researcher Preparation Towards Indigenous Research for MSR in Fourth Industrial Revolution. Dr. Binlish, please. Uh, thank you, Aditya. It's a, it's a pleasure to be... Uh... Do you see, are you able to see my screen or shall I share again? I'm able to see you and now I think your slides, yeah, slides are visible also. Both, both of you are visible. Yeah. Okay, this is, uh, this is a privilege to, to be presenting in an audience where your supervisor and uh, uh, co-researchers and the next generation of the PhD, my PhD scholars, uh, all are present. So three generations are present in the audience. So the the quality is much beyond the quantity of the audience. So I'm blessed to have the audience. I, I have also invited Professor Shada Nandra. Most of our research, we, we are doing it together. And uh, she has been a very senior researcher with MSR and been a very regular uh, attendee of AOM sessions in the past uh, 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 editions, the conferences. Uh, uh, today's topic, as Aditya told me, that uh, the audience will comprise of uh, scholars uh, who are interested in researching spirituality uh, under MSR. And uh, so uh, for the benefit of that community, this presentation is targeted. And the topic of today's presentation is research preparation towards indigenous research for MSR in uh, the context of fourth industrial revolution, uh, with special emphasis on how to engage with text, traditions, beliefs, and practices. When we say uh, there is a, when we say indigenous research, that means that we are researching in a particular context. And when we say a particular context, that context uh, contains, is revealed in text, tradition, beliefs, and practices. And researchers' job is to engage one or more of these four to actually bring out uh, you know, wisdom and knowledge in the form that it is useful for the contemporary times. So this was a brief uh, background. The most most of uh, today's discussion uh, will draw from uh, uh, some of our published work. Uh, uh, the, the first one being how to prepare the researcher for indigenous context and integrative approach. It was published in, I think, 2018. And there's a recent uh, publication also, which I've uh, mentioned in the, the last slide, where I mention all the work that could be, that will be useful in case uh, researchers are interested. So I start off with the, this uh, question that if I ask, uh, uh, you know, what is X in this equation? So many people will quickly jump to a conclusion that X is equal to three. But maybe a student of mathematics will say that, okay, X can be three and also minus three. If I say that uh, X is X represents, uh, let's say age of a person, then it cannot be minus three. So that means that I have qualified this equation with a context and that eliminated minus three. Same is uh, when we pursue any research, especially in the social science realm, when we do our hypothesis and we uh, reach a conclusion, that conclusion is often one-sided because uh, without we knowing, we are assuming a context and sometimes it is being referred to as the dominant paradigm. So a conclusion drawn from one perspective may not hold true from the other perspective. I gave this a small example that let's say uh, some research shows uh, op uh, there should be a policy on open defecation for uh, uh, you know certain countries. 
so if if i ask you a question that you know if you if you are referring to a tribal people in a, in a dense forest where there is no concept of uh, concrete and everything is so natural then the pattern of defecation will be very different than uh, what it happens you know how it happens in the urban uh, thing so to understand these nuances and there comes indigenous research but then the question arises that why we are talking about indigenous research uh, in uh, a management uh, uh, research uh, gathering it it should be a part of you know some anthropology or history class probably if uh, so i i'll come to that uh, you know uh, to answer that uh, question uh, when when we see when we engage with any indigene and uh, especially the eastern uh, context we encounter a lot of diversity in terms of uh, you know food uh, religion belief systems dresses and celebrations and what not if you if we boy, uh, if we kind of see the denominator of all these diversity we see uh, you know uh, we can use a concept of world view which explains you know how culture and civilization emanates from it so when we are engaging with an indigene we essentially are engaging with the world view and this world view is uh, is the context that we are referring to so when we say when we refer to that you know we are engaging in that indigene so the first and the foremost thing that we engage with is the world view and if we miss the world view then we end up making the same mistake as in the equation that you quickly jump on to the conclusion that x was 3 uh since uh, last uh, uh, you know yesterday also many speakers uh, spoke about uh, these concepts of spirituality and religion i wouldn't spend time i assume that there are plenty of the many definitions and i hope scholars will give more definitions in the future but this is the definition that uh, we as a research group use uh, of spirituality uh, a quality of becoming aware of the connectedness with the, the existence beyond perceived existence the key word is beyond and religion is institutionalized spirituality to so just you know be very uh, you know concise and not uh, you know get into the uh, discussion of religion versus spirituality so spirituality is something which is beyond uh, perceived existence dealing with beyond perceived existence and religion is institutionalized version of spirituality especially in the eastern context because there is there is always a, a always a, a you know this uh, debate uh, for a modern eastern researcher that uh, they don't see uh, you know much differences between religion and spirituality in the way that it is being seen in uh, east especially with hinduism so i'll come to this uh, uh, thing but for now let's uh, wherever i use the word religion in uh, my presentation i just mean institutionalized uh, manifestation of spirituality that's all uh the research in general uh, it uh, it deals with three things the knowable that is the topic of our research knower the researcher uh, him or herself knowledge that's the outcome so we often when we train a researcher we uh, we get him uh, you know initiated into a certain discipline so which sets the knowable you know the the grand questions or the the research questions that you know the researcher is searching and the definitions of knowledge that what it means to be knowledge and how the knowledge is dealt i i i was quite intrigued when i started my research journey and uh, in one of the lectures i heard that we should be knowledge creators so i was intrigued with this idea that can knowledge really be created because uh, from the shastra so from the scriptures I, i i learned that knowledge is just there it has to be realized there is nothing to be created so it totally depends on uh, the definition of uh, knowledge the ontology of knowledge that defines how you see knowledge so that uh, question becomes important it cannot be uh, uh, ignored so 
but today i am not speaking about the ontology of the importance or the ontology of knowledge so let's come back to the third uh, uh, entity in this uh, trinity is the knower the researcher and when we are dealing with researcher we are not talking about researcher skills of doing the research it is about the world view of the researcher i remember my uh, my supervisor he is also there in the audience he mentions that he mentioned that when he was researching in 1970s he he wrote uh, his thesis in, in in his way you know that it was his narrative of the research because that brought his world view into the into his thesis so that was that was and that time he contested so not everyone liked the idea that uh, uh, you know research should be positivistic and it should not be you know it should not have our uh, it it was seen as a bias but uh, there is a difference between bias and you know letting uh, the audience know your world view so here we are talking about uh, uh, you know the world view of researcher that composes that that uh, that's part of this uh, you know node in the trinity knower preparing the researcher to engage with a particular context so that way becomes uh, very much relevant because there there often uh, there may be a case where the world view of the researcher and the world view of the context is often mismatched and this mismatch can result in a uh, flawed epistemology you know maybe maybe the the context uh, expects the researcher to learn a certain things in a certain way but the researcher is used to seeing uh, things in a certain way there there is an anecdote that i sometimes use you know that uh, there was there was a teacher and there was a student so teacher uh, uh, said that there is uh, something some x substance x is there in the uh, the room uh, please get it for me the student brought the uh, uh, took a bag and went to the Anita ji Yeah I'm not able to hear him yeah same here yeah, It looks like there's some problem yeah. here maybe some connection yeah. okay. We will just wait we'll wait maybe he'll log on yeah. Maybe there is some connectivity issue so we are waiting yeah. here for just one more minute and we'll be back soon Thank you this will happen once in a while yeah and he was asking very relevant questions maybe sharda ji may be able to enlighten us um, as professor puneet says that he is working with you and maybe we can hear some words of wisdom from you sharda ji Professor Rajan is also here. Professor Rajan was is, yes. uh, is the guide of Professor Puneet Bindlesh. Okay. okay, I didn't. So know. when okay. when Professor Puneet was mentioning that his guide is present, it was Professor Rajan Mukherjee. Okay. Okay. Welcome, Professor. Yeah. Welcome. Professor. Yes. not yet logged in so sir you on mute you are saying something also rupa we are not able to hear you sir so we are not able to hear you
Yes, admit all. Admit all. Sir is now joined. He's joining. Yeah. Uh, is he trying to connect? Uh, yes, because yes, I can't joined. see him. Yeah, he's ju just joined now. He's okay. just joined. Good to see you, Professor Nandram. Okay. He's back. He's back there. Okay. Is he is Puneet back? Haan, ji. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. yes. 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 Okay. Right. Then let, let Puneet continue. Okay. 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 Uh, so, sorry, there was an electricity outage. Hello. Anyway. Uh, so I, I was uh, I was explaining that you know I was uh, using a brief anecdote of a teacher and a student that a teacher asked that you know that there is some substance uh, in the next room and uh, please get it for me and the student uh, went there assuming that it's a solid carrying a bag whereas uh, the substance may be a liquid so this is the, the state of affairs with the researcher where they, whether they they assume that what is the nature of knowledge because of their worldview. So that's why the, uh, you know, the lower preparation is necessary so that they don't make mistakes on the epistemology. Because every context, there is an epistemology. And uh, hi, here I will just briefly mention, and but I will not go into the details of that science as we know it is also a religion. So that means the epistemology of science is also cannot be taken for granted. So when we engage in with other disciplines, every discipline has uh, their ways of knowing and uh, to be at least sensitive about it and uh, prepare uh, yourself well to, uh, you know, to use it in the context it requires. So all this process basically is uh, uh, being referred to here as researcher preparation. Uh, there is a nice paper about uh, the concept of worldview by Vidal. Uh, I have given the reference on the top. There is an English translation of this paper also available. The paper was, I think, originally written in Dutch. Uh, so the, the paper mentions these uh, four uh, benefits of using this uh, construct that when we use the worldview, it, uh, uh, you know, it, 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 it uh, gives uh, it expands our, uh, you know, the ability to acquire more knowledge. Then uh, it also addresses our sociological needs you know, in terms of, because when a PhD or a research, any research is, is a two directional journey. It's not just understanding some, someone, it has also an impact on the researcher also. So that means the whole process also address certain kind of sociological, psychological needs as well. So world, using worldview also addresses that. So, and third is the life satisfaction. And also when uh, the, some of the dimensions of worldview are inadequately addressed, it leads to certain uh, uh, things which may not be desirable at an individual level or at a societal level. So this whole process of using such concepts, it, uh, it's, it's a very fulfilling process for a researcher and especially in a topic like spirituality uh, although i mean many uh, many speakers yesterday have uh, touched upon this why we need to uh, why why researching on spirituality is important but many uh, recent reports have suggested that uh, most of the challenges that are uh, that will uh, be uh, that we all will be facing most of them have a spiritual solution and they are dealing with humans. If we consider human and environmental damage or we consider social cohesion erosion, so all of these and having a negative outlook of the world, all of these are, uh, you know, they have a, uh, they, they expect something coming from the research on spirituality. And why study indigenous for spirituality? When we see the last at least 20 years of research in uh, spirituality, all the tools, techniques, if you see the fundamental concepts uh, uh, you know, used, they have been borrowed from some or the other uh, indigenous contexts, whether it could be Buddhism, Hinduism, or 
or Taoism or Jewism or Christianity or or maybe some uh, community ideas. So a, a large body of uh, these concepts, they come from uh, you know, those uh, uh, indigenes, if I may use the word now in that sense. So it so it's so natural that it the, the research to engage with them in a fundamental or in a justful way requires for us uh, to pursue indigenous research from where these concepts have been coming. Because first 20 years of this, uh, this uh, you know, the scholarship in uh, spirituality was spent in creating, establishing the need for this discipline. Next 20 to 30 years, 40 years could be spent on actually be strengthening the concepts and deepening the concepts. And from where they come from, getting into the roots of these concepts. And why do we do that? Some tangible uh, uh, reasons for studying indigenous I've mentioned. Uh, when we engage with it, we will get more uh, richer philosophical concepts, which may be of scientific importance in the future. We uh, we understand uh, the, the diversity that we engage with in a much better way. And there are, of course, outcomes, economical, political. We get tech, uh, we get new techniques, uh, for example, yoga and uh, other uh, spiritual techniques. Uh, I, I, in the, the title of this, uh, this session, I mentioned that engaging with text, traditions, beliefs, and practices. Whenever we engage with, on the, I couldn't change the image where I have mentioned text. I mean text, traditions, beliefs, and practices. So whenever a researcher sitting in a particular context engages with uh, a other context, there is an initial understanding which is governed by the dominant worldview of that researcher. When, the, after this first engagement, uh, the researcher goes back with a new understanding of the new found knowledge. Then uh, uh, a new, uh, their own context is kind of uh, superimposed by the new context. And then a new understanding again emerges. This whole cycle is, uh, uh, in, in the case of text, it is known as hermeneutic circle, but there is no I mean, uh, term coins for coined for other beliefs, practices, and uh, traditions. But the similar phenomenon happen whenever we engage with uh, any indigenous uh, uh, context. So that means it necessitates to be aware of our own worldview because our initial understanding depends on it. So why it is important so that we uh, our blind spots. We don't have blind spots when we are seeing the context. And when we are when we are aware of the worldview of the context that we engage in, the new understanding will be uh, we will be able to contextualize in a better manner. Well, when these uh, uh, you know this, this these approaches uh, this uh, circular approaches these uh, are going on with such a Many, many debates happen in the, uh, you know, in the researcher journey. So some of these debates I've mentioned, and uh, there may be more, they are just uh, sample, especially in the spirituality research, whether to go for an applied thing or a fundamental thing. Because as you go a little deeper into the concepts of spirituality, there is a strong, very strong urge to go, funda to go towards the fundamental uh, uh, you know, fundamental research aspect of that concept, and that, uh, and, but the time is limited. The resources are limited sometimes in the research, so there is a trade-off between whether you want to pursue applied or a fundamental, and how much fundamental and how much applied or fundamental only. Then, uh, are we are we uh, knowing the known or we want to explore the unknown? Given by the definition of spirituality, this it is about beyond. A perceived existence. So that means that uh, uh, majorly it is dealing with knowing the unknown. So are we are we pursuing that? Then there is a there there is a debate of an encounter in the dealing with concepts pertaining to spirituality, essentialist versus existentialist. Some say that it cannot be measured or cannot be defined. Some say that it has to be defined. It has to be measured in 
in order to make it useful. So these debates often are part of it. Then there is uh, uh, the normative debates that this is and this is not. So you know, classification or the declassification paradox. So how to be integrative with that? Then uh, uh, should we do the nomothetic approach that is universalist stance, one shoe fits all stance of or definitions of concepts, or we go specific definitions, be indigenous. So in spirituality research, most of the experiences are very ideographic in nature. When a searcher really goes deeper into uh, things, so there is also the, again there is a there is a debate, and there are there is no right or wrong answers to it. It's just a process. It uh, uh, and appropriate trade-offs or uh, trade-offs or understanding uh, emerges. Then uh, convergence, divergence, deductive, inductive, or So to uh, to sum up these kind of debates, uh, the researcher often has uh, you know, uh, three choices: either to go towards the research of faith, where they say that everything which is in indigenous is perfect, it's okay, it's good, and uh, let's pursue it. And whatever has stopped it, uh, you go full steam in a uh, you know uh, equipped with the postmodernist uh, research methods to pursue it. So this could be one direction. Second direction on the other extreme could be research of suspicion. That whatever we hold on to as dominant and scientific, we hold on to it. And whatever else that we encounter, we see it with, a, with an eye of suspicion and try to always find a way that that will not work. So all the negative hypothesis to begin with. So that's uh, the second uh, extreme of it. The third uh, could be research of contemplation where we are just searching for truth and in the by doing justice with the epistemology of the context so these are the three ways and we see that uh, the uh, the right extreme the research of suspicion has been dominant uh, for uh, many decades research of faith has has come up in a very limited way but of late uh, it has uh, uh, we are seeing ex an exponential increase in that. Uh, but there is there is a clear scope for research of contemplation, which uh, which needs a, a very in-depth researcher preparation to uh, to pursue. Uh, the paper uh, "How to Prepare an Indigenous Researcher" talks about uh, four phases of uh, researcher preparation. First is reverse social engineering. I, uh, in the in the paper, it, this is referred as uh, uh, sometimes a process of kind of deglobalization, because in the in in the overconnected world in the fourth industrial revolution, there is a, a there is a there is a varying degree of uh, uh, societies being engineered socially, and to be able to uncover uh, uh, to be able to remove this layer of uh, social engineering to see the indigenous context, the underlying indigenous context, this first phase in undertaking. This first phase uh, and the second phase, uh, the self deglobalization and contextualization, it usually happens by uh, critically examining uh, the, the, the various aspects of culture and other expressions of knowledge, language, clothing, food, medicine, expressions of art, festivals, ideas, beliefs, etc., and asking critical questions about how, why, what, why do we do what we do, and how do we do. Asking these critical questions reveal a lot of uh, new insights. For instance, in uh, the research that I pursued 10 years back, I asked this question that why do I wear uh, a pant and a shirt with a tie in uh, in, a, in a climate like India in summers? You know, just because every uh, because it is considered business uh, formals in uh, this part of the world. But why? Is it is it uh, is it in sync with the environment? Is it uh, in sync with the you know, the the context that we are in? 
the food, the way we take food, etc. So these are very critical questions. The choices that we make in terms of the products that we would buy, the uh, you know the choice of knowledge sources that we have. So all of these are examined in this how, why, what critical questions, and then uncovered. And there may be some uh, uh, experiences. We'll talk about it a little later after this slide. In the third phase, uh, it's important that uh, the researcher develops an integrative perspective to pursue the research of contemplation. This uh, phase, they develop understanding from multiple perspectives, not just one dominant perspective with which they arrive at the context or the, uh, the philosophy of the context itself and back, but from multiple perspectives and try to move away from binary reductive categories that this is and this is not. And the normative uh, uh, you know, uh, conclusions about the context or the aspects that uh, of uh, the culture and the things that we talked about in the first phase. Then in this process, dissolution of interdisciplinary boundaries because the, the boundaries uh, the, the disciplinary boundaries also carry the world that where of discipline ends. This is finance, this is marketing, this is organizational behavior, this is HR, this is economics, this is fun, uh, information systems. So where do the boundaries start and where do they end? So these uh, the dissolutions of uh, boundaries for a moment is very much necessary because the real world problem uh, is not uh, does not come in a watertight way from a discipline. So this uh, third phase uh, uh, is that part where we take care of these three points. The fourth phase is again uh, indigenous worldview immersion. This immersion, although it's theoretically in writing, it's pretty easy, but uh, uh, a researcher in worldview has uh, rightfully said that if you want to change someone's worldview, you have to start 100 years before that person is born. So how can we claim or how can we uh, go through a small research preparation phase and claim to be immersed ourselves adequately uh, in that particular NB gene? So it's, it's indeed a challenge and there is no right or wrong answers about it or there, there is not a sure short way, but this is the closest that we get to where we engage in that uh, context through their cultural expressions. And then when we prepare for indigenous research ways, these are the uh, some of the things that I mentioned on the slides, which are important. Epistemological expansion. I'm taking an example from the Hindu tradition. For instance, science uh, gives us two main, uh, uh, two and a half, I say. I use this word <laughs> uh, you know, for epistemology of science. Science. Uh, has 2.5 ways of uh, knowing. One is observation, the second is inference, and uh, the half are the research journals, which we quote to build upon our argumentation for research. So, but when we engage in a certain tradition, and I'm taking an example of uh, the Hindu context, there are, uh, uh, there the epistemology is called Pramana. So there we have Pratyaksha, which is, uh, which can be loosely translated to observation. And we have Anumana, which is loosely translated to inference. Then there is something called Shabda Pramana or Agam Pramana, which refers to the knowledge which is flowing from or text and traditions. And uh, essentially from an oral tradition. So this uh, third way is pretty important in this context. And when we engage in this third way, there is also a prerequisite just like any other scientific way. If you have to take observation, uh, if you have to use observation as a way of knowing in a, in a scientific uh, method, methodology, there also we, we have to be trained on that methodology, on those instruments which we are using to observe. Same way, when we are engaging with Shabda Pramana, we have to prepare ourselves to be able to uh, study a particular text. And uh, fortunately, Every text in uh, the Hindu context, they, they mention in either direct or indirect way that who is the adhikari for that and what are the lakshanas or what are the qualities to be uh, to engage with that text 
or tradition. <clears throat> there is another uh, uh, aspect of this preparation for indigenous search base. Uh, I will not go into the details of uh, all of them, but I'll just bring your attention to the fourth point, reversing the gaze. It is very important that while after epistemological expansion, you again see and reflect back on the dominant worldview from where you arrived at the first place. So, so this is a, a reflection of the dominant research view with which we actually started. This is uh, uh, some uh, some of the points uh, uh, just to you know, inspire the audience on uh, Hindu hermeneutical paradigm. Uh, Hindu hermeneutical paradigm has uh, th there's some of the key points include that they they do not see soteriology or spiritual uh, you know the, the ways to pursue spirituality and philosophy as separate. So there is no distinction between science and religion per se. And here I am using the word science in, in the, something that is that uh, a discipline for knowledge. Uh, second is seeking versus believing and the dynamic notion of sacredness. So there is no one text which is uh, which is the only sacred text which has to be believed. There are plenty of texts and there are different uh, varying degree of sacredness that is associated by different Hindus or Hindu communities or groups. For some, Bhagavad Gita could be the, the most sacred text. For some, Vedas could be the most sacred text. For some, 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 some other scripture. For some, some other scriptures. So because these scriptures are seen as manuals to be able to pursue spirituality, so there is a seeking relationship with the texts and traditions and not the believing one, which changes the, the way that they are perceived or they are, the way that we engage with them. All the texts, and uh, most traditions, they are structured around life phases, uh, whether it's the first phase of your life, second phase, third phase, and fourth phase, and what occupation you are in and what is the intention of uh, your engagement with the text. And then most of these uh, texts are written in a dialogue format. Someone is asking the question and someone is answering. And uh, the interesting aspect of these answering is the answers are not nomothetic in nature or not, uh, normative in nature they are uh, they are kind of they should be seen as multi paradigmatic narratives for example the case of bhagavad gita it has 18 chapters uh, arjun uh, in a state of dilemma asks uh, certain questions krishna answers krishna shows uh, 18 uh, broad perspectives to look at the world which are being referred as 18 types of yoga in bhagavad gita Space, same as in the case of Panchatantra. Panchatantra is not a not one story, uh, not different stories and ending up with moral of the story. It's just one big story where the characters of the story, they keep talking about multiple, uh, uh, you know, perspectives to the same situation in their own way. So th this, the whole storytelling format is not uh, normative in uh, the approach which uh, again uh, brings back this notion of seeking uh, kind of engagement with scriptures. In, in the interest of time, I'm, I don't want to eat away the time that we will have for uh, discussion. So this is my last uh, slide that I'm uh, taking. This is the uh, researcher experience phase that we, uh, uh, that one, goes through the the phase one is when uh, the, the researcher is, is in the dominant worldview engaging with a different uh, worldview so there is always a dichotomy that this is it and this is not phase one is about overcoming that repulsion that comes out of this uh, binary uh, uh, dichotomous you know, perspective to things after uh, uh, phase one when uh, someone gets to taste the indigenous uh, concepts, culture, there may be a case when uh, you know the, it's it's so uh, so much enjoying or cherishing or 
So the, the researcher starts eulogizing that, oh, this is the only thing, oh, this is, this is the thing. And, you know, so this is the discovery, you know, this is, so eulogizing about the indigenous worldview, but uh, as uh, time progresses, you know, then phase three comes where overwhelming from, because all these uh, indigenous contexts, they could be overwhelming because it is an entire, they, they are complete worldviews in themselves and we cannot absorb the entire worldview in few years. So it could be overwhelming. So after overwhelming phase, then uh, uh, phase four comes where is, there is a calmness, a spiritual calmness that sets in with respect to this, uh, uh, with respect to the context. And then uh, it is, uh, then the phase of self-awareness and experience from doing to being the journey, you know, continues. And this whole cycle repeats over and over again in many times in, 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 uh, in, uh, in this paper, we also mentioned the uh, importance of prolonged engagement with the with this MDG, because all these phases they do not happen in a few weeks or you know few months. It requires uh, a very prolonged engagement. We we use this uh, and we published some work. One of the work that we published was a case study done on. Uh, leadership of uh, one of the youngest uh, climber, Everest climber from Northeast, Tine Mena. She comes from a tribal uh, uh, region from Northeast and uh, they live in a totally different worldview than an urban worldview. And but so we, we, we used uh, various methodologies and methods to understand them and then we wrote about it. So you're welcome to go through the paper. I, I will share the uh, paper uh, citation after the uh, lecture. These are some of the research that uh, you may find useful. Uh, the first two deal with the, how spiritual, how we conceptualize spirituality. The, the first three. The fourth one is about the researcher preparation, the paper that I talked about in this discussion. Mm -hmm. The fifth one, we engage with the yogic texts and uh, we analyze concepts. So it illustrates how uh, we, after epistemological expansion, how the, the texts are brought to the concepts that we deal with. The next is uh, the integrative research approaches that we can use to pursue indigenous studies. So these are some of the papers. I think I, I end with this and uh, I, we can use uh, the remaining time for discussions. Uh, over to Aditya. If... Hello, Aditya. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, Aditya, I'm I'm done. I mean, I we can use the remaining time for uh, you know any questions that uh, questions or discussions or comments or. Yeah. So, uh, participants, uh, if you have any doubts or queries or observations, please feel free to. Uh, discuss with Professor Puneet with the gathering. Or if you have any insights to offer. I, I would like to ask the question or just for a discussion. Yes, uh, shall I? Yes, yes. please go okay. ahead. Yeah, I, I was, uh, when uh, Professor uh, Binlish talked about the three types of hermeneutic, 
research of suspicion, research of faith, and research of contemplation. And he made the link to, um, I mean, uh, scholarly work. I would like to know what is his view on positioning spirituality in management context? If you look uh, at all these three approaches, because like uh, the uh, research um, based on faith, is it that we can say that that's more of the uh, existential uh, list approach? And when we talk about the research of uh, hermeneutics of suspicion, is that the uh, dominating paradigm which we are seeing at the moment uh, when we look at uh, management, spirituality and religion? Uh, for example, uh, the very fact that many of the research is um, based on building hypothesis first. Uh, so you need to look at what other dominating um, scholars have been saying about it. So you have to kind of, uh, you don't give floor to, to new ideas. Uh, it's more influenced by research uh, of suspicion, contemplation, is then left as uh, you can say, the, the, the way uh, which may bring spirituality and management context more, I mean, may, may enrich that. It, would you share that idea or? Yeah. I, uh, I am reminded of, uh, you know, our discussions in the past. Uh, and uh, I quote uh, Rajan Day when uh, he, in our initial discussions, he said that most of the hypothesis, majority of the hypothesis are not new to social science researchers who are researching them. So they already know what the, the conclusion is. So either uh, there is a high degree of suspicion or there is high degree of uh, faith that this will definitely happen. You know, they, they are just finding a reason for believing it. So there is a plenty of uh, room for research of contemplation where we can engage. So if we don't do that next five to 10 years, I'm afraid that uh, this will just pass off as uh, uh, another fade. And uh, someone shared an article, Rajmuj shared an article, which I'm yet to you know, read thoroughly, where some researcher has said that spirituality is just uh, a fraud concept in a way. He, he didn't use the strong word as fraud, but it's, you know, so uh, we have to see the arguments because these arguments are coming because either they see that we are pursuing the search of faith, mostly, or the suspicion, and it's not going to help bringing in new knowledge. And because spirituality is something we are not talking of recipes also, because recipes were all uh, there before also, before the spirituality research uh, emerged on the scene. So if we if we keep doing the same stuff, we will just do the same thing and the new label will be spirituality. So here, research uh, of contemplation definitely has to be you know, looked upon as an alternative and new voices have to be given platform for that. I, I'm not sure, have I, ad I mean, addressed this point? Mm -hmm. And that brings the link to the indigenous uh, views. Yes, 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 yes. Good, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I, I see some raised hands. Naida, Naida. Naida, go ahead. Naida, yes. question. And yes, then it's uh, probably you can ask. Naida, go ahead. Please. Yes, thank you. Um, so, sorry, I joined just halfway through, so I missed the first part, so I'm going to have to watch the video <laughs> for that part. But I did see the um, researcher's journey. Um, I saw a little bit before that, but the researcher's journey. And I was curious about um, the types of researcher profiles that were on the right side, um, activist. Uh, would you mind just briefly just talking a little bit about why you named them the way that you did? Because I found I, the language I, very interesting. Oh, OK. <laughs> it was In the language that I thought was interesting. Okay, in the interest of time, I, I skipped that, but I, I will, since you've asked, I'll go through those four uh, 
when we engage with indigene then uh, you know when uh, we we may develop uh, as uh, you know in one of the four roles we may become an activist that okay you know we we know that indigene is suppressed by someone and we have to attack the attacker mm -hmm. so those kind of researches they will do, draw comparatives that ours is this and theirs was this ours and theirs there is a comparative then there are uh, defender activists who are called intellectual warriors just to prove that okay what you are doing this is made in our land <laughs> you know what is what you are doing this is also ours this is also ours claiming 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 this is that's defender activists the third is uh, where the indigene has been uh, oppressed so there is lot of uh, injuries happen to the you know the context so providing care to that indigene providing healing to that indigene so healing or resurrection in a positive way or kind of uh, rejuvenating the lost traditions the texts or culture so that's the third uh, category of researchers the fourth is just living with continuity it's so amazing i mean i'm just referring to the because i have not traveled to uh, you know uh, much part of the world <laughs> so i can talk about india uh, the the indian civilization is such a continuous civilization that there are still people living the way that they were living thousands of years back in remote forest villages etc so some of the customs some of the traditions so it may be the researcher aligns themselves to the traditions in a very neat way so those are the four possible outcomes of a researcher who really pursue indigenous fundamental research to the core so have i uh, answered that yes thank you very much i find that very um helpful and uh, you may be seeing a, a communication from me because uh, there's a lot that I'm working on in this area. So um, for few, future conversation, thank you very much. I, I see. Yeah, so I'll, share, I'll, I'll share his email address. I'll share email address of Professor Pune. Thank you. Professor, you're saying something, Professor Dinesh. Yeah, I see some more raised hands from Soumya yeah. Dutta. Yes, from you. So in the fourth phase of the research preparation, you mentioned that uh, Bharati or research methodology. Can you focus on what uh, you want to say in this term? Uh, Bharati or research methodology. Uh, you know the word Bharat, by the way, uh, for the people who are not from India. Uh, India is a, is a, is a name that Britishers actually use for the country, and uh, the original name of the country is Bharat. so when uh, the name bharatiya research methodologies for a western person it means indian research methodologies but for indians it is being referred to as bharatiya research methodologies so when we say bharatiya research methodologies i am essentially referring to the indian epistemology so which uh, includes uh, the uh, oral traditions and other also ways of knowing there are some uh, scriptures who talk about six ways of knowing there are some scriptures who talk about five four three but all of them they talk about at least three observation inference and the oral tradition and there is a manner in which oral traditions are pursued for texts as well as you know for example yoga you know all the yogi techniques that you see and the way they are just uh, you know converted into recipes and just handed out to masses it may not be the right way to pursue so for, for a researcher they have to engage in a much deeper way so that is what i am referring to by indigenous uh, bharatiya research thank you sir and also we have we have written about uh, uh, you know shastrarth in one of the papers that uh, uh, the way that we see hypothesis and conclusion by hypothesis and then research this research design also have we have to revisit because in a bharatiya research way we do in a different way we do a pur paksha uttar paksha then we do samanvaya and then we have a nyaya uh, framework also nyaya darshana framework also to engage with uh, you know investigation then we have tarka we have plenty of uh, research methods we are not restricted with only the dominant methods so this entire gamut of epistemology the methods and all those uh, you know this collectively is being 
referred to as Bharatiya Research Methodologies. I'm, I'm glad that in last five years, especially, many researchers have started uh, pursuing it and giving it a serious thought in uh, using it for their research. So, sir, Rajini, would you like to add something, sir? Yeah, I just wish to make a broader comment. <clears throat> you know, why talk about indigenous research in, when we are talking about spirituality? So, I think, uh, I don't think there's much time, but just want to tell you an anecdote and then my, my conceptualization of it. Once we were conducting an international seminar in MDI, Management Development Institute, where Puneet and I were there, and uh, I proposed an interest area of indigenous research. And from the submissions, I understood that People thought indigenous is only, you know, those people like native in Indian Americans or Africans or, you know, uh, tribal people in Australia or, I mean, I was shocked that indigene is something which belongs to a place. And we must realize that what is called modern science is a particular expression of a particular indigene, which is Northern Europe. So what we call modern science is a particular indigenous way of knowing in which spirituality and the materialism have been dichotomized. So when we talk, when we want to talk, you know, Christian spirituality has been put aside in that civilization. So the, those people, Europeans and Ameri North Americans, white North Americans, need to recover their Christian spirituality. People like Puneet and me, we have to recover our Vedic spirituality. Somebody may have to recover their Buddhist spirituality because fortunately for humankind, our ancestors were more sensitive to spirituality than us. It is not that that's the end of knowledge, but that was, that is a, that was a wonderful beginning. So indigenous means for each one of us to get in touch with our origins, our ancestors, recovering the spirituality, kind of spirituality which existed. And there is enough, enough evidence that every culture had its own form of spirituality. Uh, if you go back to American Indians, they had wonderful ways of looking at the world, perhaps uh, better than many. So that's why I believe research into spirituality, whether it is related to management or other aspects of contemporary world, cannot ignore those ancient spiritual traditions. And I think uh, it would be a very long shot for somebody, any one of us to take a universalistic view on spirituality, at least maybe for next 100 years. So what I think researchers can do and perhaps should attempt to do is to recover their own spiritual tradition, examine it critically in their current context. So this, this work which has been done by Puneet uh, and he, this was his work. This is what I discovered working with him that he was far beyond me in pursuing this line of research. And so uh, I was amazed to see how Puneet uh, undertook this self-indigenization while undergoing PhD research. So I just wanted to make this overall comment that indigenous is misunderstood in the Western world today. Westerners are also indigenous. This is my humble submission to them. And unless they get out of it and they realize that modern science is a product of historical evolution development in the Western world. And hence, it actually has inherent limitations in doing research on spirituality because they have dichotomized spirituality and science. So there's a, there's a, there's a big challenge for Western world to unless they get over this challenge, they cannot do good 
research into spirituality and management. So this is my humble submission. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, sir. I'm I'm glad that you mentioned these uh, two important points. That indigenous everyone has an indigenous. That's the first point. Second, that our ancestors infuse spirituality with every uh, human dimension. So uh, we have Professor Shada Nandra, whose uh, inaugural lecture for Nine Road Business University, where he, she was appointed as Professor of Spirituality. So she called for infusing uh, every discipline with spirituality in a fundamental way. So this is the work that our research group is pursuing with uh, everyone's blessings and collaboration. We are excited about it. Professor uh, Bhatnagar, uh, Vikas Raya Bhatnagar, you wanted to say something, sir? No, Puneet, I am I'm, uh, I'm listening to it all and learning. Thank you so much. Eh? Okay. Anita ji, you wanted to say something? Yeah, it's a great session and uh, uh, very uh, informative uh, inputs about indigenous concepts. Yeah, I have learned something new today. Thank you so much. Yeah, and very pertinent to our theme also. Yeah, it is. Very pertinent to our theme. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Bindish. Actually, Thanks to Charda ji, because just yeah. Professor Pete has mentioned that uh, you are uh, uh, enlightening the Western world uh, regarding spirituality, and I feel so proud about this. Yeah, thank you so much. It, it is worth mentioning that, uh, you know, we, we, we are very new to spirituality in MSR. But this MSR has, uh, you know, over the years they have seen uh, a lot, a, a big struggle, and there were many people who people who contributed to, you know, to what it is today. And Shada ji is also one of, you know, who have really yeah. staked their careers. They are, really, you know, I would say that, you know, they they really staked their careers for this day that we are talk, we are seeing spirituality as an important thing for a much broader discipline and management. Totally and I think it's it's we should be proud mentioning that a business school as Nairoda has taken this call to set up a chair in business and spirituality, which is maybe uh, the only one in the world. So we are talking about spirituality management and religion, but most of the scholars, for them, it's it's just like a a byproduct. While we say, you know, if this is an important thing to do, then let's put it as a dominant topic, more than a dominant topic, which we want to now build as a kind of a discipline. But it will take a lot of time. Uh, we need a lot of people like all of you to contribute. Uh, like uh, Professor Rajin Gupta ji said, you know, we can take time to build uh, it as a universal concept but let's start to be close to our own practical wisdom we have all around us in many of the uh, countries. And from that perspective, we can build it up uh, and, and try to understand. And if you look at spirituality, uh, how it is being measured, there are a few instruments uh, which have been used all over again and again. And I've used two of them uh, for example, developed in Asia, the scale of Pachawang and one of the students, Arjun, uh, uh, in Nepal. And we just use it in a Dutch context, but we can't get uh, valid outcomes because the worldview was different. So we need to contextualize all of these measurements. We can't just copy and paste and say, okay, you are going to do the research in spirituality in India, and we are just using Ashmanshan and Dushon's, uh, uh, you know, scale. And of course, using a scale itself is reducing this, this broad phenomena itself. So thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. So um, uh, officially our session, uh, am I audible? Aditya, uh, can we can we can we end the session with the Shanti mantra? If, if absolutely, have... absolutely, Go ahead. Yeah, I'm I'm doing an invocation uh, 
which we usually do after the invocation means that uh, out of in uh, you know uh, the completeness has come uh, everything and uh, it will again go back to completeness so in 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 a simpler terms infinity plus infinity is equal to infinity if you take out infinity from infinity infinity remains this is a beautiful verse so i will be chatting that in sanskrit om purnamida purnamidam purnat purnamudachyate purnasya purnamadaya purnameva vishishyate om shanti 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 thank you so we still have uh, the next session begins at uh, at the hour i'm around uh, 10 minutes but we still have time please please continue please if you want to share anyone your insights your feelings uh, or the way formally we'll meet it's a very interesting session uh, during my research career uh, i didn't at all worry about publishing in western journals mm -hmm. so there was no none of this sir uh, you know uh, mad race mad rush of rankings and all that so i have i was saved from that but i think now it is a reality and uh, i think professor sharda is uh, in my understanding is really negotiating it much better so i would like her to take on this <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, that is a very perfect way of saying it negotiating it because our original uh, ideas the way we write it it is for example like 15000 words this is the way we want to express because each of these concepts uh, we need to explain just like a concept of mind we will have so many explanations so many layers to explain while in the western context it's just like in one concept so we need to do it again and again for with our dialogues punichi and i we will have dialogues and say what is really essential then again we will say okay there are too many it, it is overwhelming for the people we have to go and and because the journals ask for 7000 words 8000 words 5000 words so then we have to uh, pick up one piece and say let's at least do it just recently we wrote an article on spiritual care which was uh, i think it, we had to explain all these aspects like what is dharma but then these people say oh there are too many words our students will not be able to understand it and too many why why are you using the original sanskrit words i said because that is what we are talking about so it's very difficult because sometimes it is just a a concept and they want us to put it in a construct way but mm -hmm. if we put it in a construct we are not able to do justice to explain so in for getting a publication i mean it took us a lot of work has been done by punichi in his thesis which already took him i think 5 years or 10 years to you know to put it on paper then from that stage to get it published it took us 5 years mm -hmm. and then still it means that uh, we are able to take one small piece maybe mm -hmm. of all the thinking and like now in this research on spiritual care we have been thinking about it for a whole year how to put it uh, in on paper for a research uh, a chapter but it's not done yet it will require two three uh, uh, you know rounds for ourselves to shorten it and so it is a challenge it's not easy ideally we should have journals who are open giving space and like the academy of this discovery journal would be the best place but still the people dominating those journals have their own world views so whether mm -hmm. they will grasp what we are trying to say or not it's very difficult and to get mm -hmm. in a uh, journal and have a ranking means that many people should uh, cite you to get to that stage it's mm -hmm. again difficult <laughs> what we try to do is at least uh, i'm not trying to be in that red tracing that should be only 
high rank journal, when we feel our uh, thoughts are ripened enough, whatever uh, journal is taking it, we are publishing it. Sometimes people will say, oh, these are so many innovative ideas. It should go to a very high rank journal. I say, yes, I know, but it will take another five years to get there. And by that time, no one is going to use it. We want to get out with, I mean, to put it in the universe, our ideas, so that people are taking it and working uh, uh, further on it. And, and you know, ex ex I mean, expanding this whole uh, team, uh, this whole discipline of spirituality. We need people to work. If we wait for ourselves five years to get it published in a high rank journal, it's very difficult. Mm. Then no one will, then it will be only a high spirituality and then it will be gone. And I believe it is a discipline or we need to work towards this as a discipline. Mm. I hope I, I, I gave some. Yes, yes. And I, I just, one last additional question because I'm a scholar practitioner, meaning that I'm coming into scholarship or academia, I'm doing a doctorate in business administration, so a DBA, but I'm a practitioner. So I'm someone who was a lecturer university, that's my profession, speaking, but workshop facilitation, being inside of companies. And so I also think about the practical practitioner side of much of what you're all speaking about and that putting it in the journal no matter the ranking is a wonderful thing to of course encourage the internal system to also embrace these ideas and thoughts but then it's also so how the, do those outside of this world also hear about this work and so this is what I'm also referencing thinking about for myself maybe in my own research but also just in general so i was just curious is there a practitioner side also in your thinking yes absolutely practice we, we try to make some case studies workshops and another way is writing books because in mm -hmm. books you have space and you know these books are not uh, ranked in that sense you don't get credits in the university if you write a book or a book chapter but many of our uh, i mean uh, our output we we just want to express the output in, in any any outlet. So in that sense, it's there. In, in books, you get the space to express. Wonderful. Um, if it's possible to be in touch with you, um, Sharda, is that correct? Yes, 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 we are in the same team. Uh, so if you uh, connect to Punit, it's, it's fine. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. And good luck with your research. Huh? <laughs> Thank you. I'm at the beginning of the journey, so we'll see how it goes. Wonderful. wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. You are muted, Aditya. Thank you. Great participation. As Puriji rightly pointed out, the numbers are few, but uh, a lot of richness and very nice discussion. Thank you, Shada ma'am. Thank you, Puneet sir. Thank you, Rajan sir. I, I, for your input. I saw a comment in the chat box that the next session will start in you know, five minutes or seven minutes. So I, I I wanted to respond to that, that all the discussion that is happening right now is like uh, in a real conference face-to-face. -face. This is something which is outside the room. <laughs> so we are, so we are having. Yeah. In, in, in a real conference, we get an opportunity after the class, after the session, that we get to speak with each other. So in a, in a Zoom session, this uh, the break time is being used to just have a casual conversation. <laughs> but uh, I, I thought for the first time, the conversation in the break time is even more intense than the usual session discussion. I mean, it's, uh, the session was so interesting. Perhaps uh, one hour is it, uh, we thought it is good enough time, but it is not. Looks like uh, uh, the ideas that you brought me. Was so Actually, Shada, ji, Shada ji mentioned it's like, you know, when we write a paper, 15,000 to 20,000 words, you have to include the vocabulary of that in the gene. So I have to cut down the presentation by removing all the, the Sanskrit terms because for the audience, which is not conversant with the, those terms, so otherwise it would have been a long affair, a long drawn session. So this is a challenge which I think everyone faces <laughs> when dealing with the topics pertaining to speciality. <laughs> have you ever given that 
presentation in a conference, Puneet? Uh, I have I have given it a few occasions, but not in a conference, I think. Ah, huh, okay. I would think it would be amazing if you did that. <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe we can have a separate session on the MSR talk and Puneet sir and Rajan sir together and ma'am Shada ma'am. See if you can take a separate session, seeing the interest, I'll suggest to the MSR committee room because a specific session on this. Uh, I, I just wanted to add one thing. The next session is on Krishna. And you know, uh, this session was supposed to be taken by the Bhishma Rajan sir. And for some reasons, he, he suggested that would be, uh, you uh, get in touch with Puneet. He will be able to give some insights. And so the Arjuna has taken the session instead of Bhishma Pitama Rajan sir. And now after the, the session, um, now we'll move to a discussion by Professor Govindaji in another one minute or two. Thank you, Aditya. Thank you, everyone.